thank you very much again. I would have made this mistake. Uh, and I probably, and I will probably do it many times. Okay, going back to the slides. Can you see the slides? Yeah. Yes. Okay, so the motion of massive particles in special relativity is described by word lines. Uh, word lines are curves in, in, in the space time. Um, curves in, in general relativity or, or, or in our lecture will be considered uh, parameterized curves. So it's not just a set of points through which the, uh, the uh, body actually moves. We also make sure there is a parameterization. So we fix, an, uh, we fix a, a parameter lambda and a curve is basically three functions x mu giving us points on, along the curve on lambda. Uh, there is infinitely many ways in which we can parameterize the curve. Uh, the simplest one, and the one which is mostly in the spirit of, of non-relativistic physics, would be to use the coordinate time of a given coordinate frame in which we're looking at, the, at, a given following situ at a given situation. So x mu of x0 corresponding to the coordinate time is just x0 and positions of the particle at a given moment. The derivative or the tangent vector is then one and simply the standard velocity, the components of the standard velocity. And this parameterization is okay, except that it's very much uh, inertial frame dependent. Uh, it's fairly easy to check that if the velocity of, of a particle is smaller than the speed of light, then the uh, length of this uh, tangent vector or its product with itself using using the matrix eta is less than zero. So it is a time-like vector. V frame. So find a frame in which E0, the zero vector, is basically aligned with this velocity vector. This is a frame whose center of reference is at a given moment exactly aligned with uh, our uh, uh, with the body we're looking at. Uh, and in that case, E0 turns out to be gamma, the Lorentz factor times this vector over here. And this is also known as the body's four velocity. And this, this vector has the, U, the vector of four velocity has the property of being entirely normalized in the sense that its product with itself is minus one. Mm, yeah, it's also future pointing in the sense that the zero component, the time component points into the future, which by definition in our case is positive. Uh, and in any co-moving frame, we have E0 equal to this four velocity. We can also use it to define the proper time. I think we did it last time. Uh, the proper time, unlike the coordinate time, is defined intrinsically uh, by the motion of the particle. And it's a time given by uh, a clock in, on, on, on board of the, of the body we are looking at, we assume that the clock uh, ticks exactly at the same rate as any kind of commoving clock in an inertial frame. The derivative with respect to proper time as the time parameter is the four velocity. Uh, as a particular case, we can think about massive particles moving with constant velocity. Such bodies could be uh, centers of another Initial reference frame. Uh, if we give one point A along this curve, then obviously this is a possible parameterization of a curve uh, of a body, massive body moving with constant velocity. Uh, this is not a unique parameterization. You can always reparameterize a given word line of this kind. You can add a constant uh, and shift the reference point at the same time. If you do it, you can check that you obtain exactly the same curve, just the same straight line corresponding to the same motion of a massive particle, but uh, using different A and different tau. Okay, another very important quantity uh, we need to talk about is something called far momentum. So we assume we have a particle whose rest mass we know is given by M. Rest mass is simply the mass of a particle as measured in its commoving frame. And we define the four momentum to be m times the four velocity or gamma m, gamma m vi, where v is the standard uh, free velocity. 
the idea is that this quantity combines two important concepts, energy and momentum of a particle. Instead of being two separate things, uh, a, a scalar and a three vector, they become a, a, a part of a larger geometric object, a four vector. Uh, now, it is a fact that local forces, local interactions of particles conserve this four momentum uh, in the sense that if, we, if you have a collision of a larger number of particles, the total four momentum is conserved meaning that the energy is conserved and also the linear momentum is conserved. Uh, it's very useful to look at this quantity here uh, in small velocity limit. So we assume that V is much smaller than one or equivalently that the velocity uh, in our old, more familiar system of humans, let's say meters of second, divided by the light speed is much smaller than one. So this is a strong, this is a non-relativistic limit. Uh, in that case, gamma or the Lorentz factor can be approximated as one plus half of velocity squared plus higher order terms. Uh, and we can write P mu as mass plus one half mass V squared plus higher order corrections uh, of the order of three. And the momentum is simply MVI plus O of V3. This begins to look a little bit like the mm, mm, uh, like the kinetic energy and the standard momentum. We just need to reintroduce C in order to go back to the standard world of standard physics we know. Um, so we express velocity using the old velocity in meters per second. Uh, we obtain this equation over here. And now if we define the old energy as C squared times the zero component, we get MC squared plus one half MV old squared plus higher order corrections. And if we define the momentum as C light speed times the uh, spatial part of form momentum, we get MVI plus higher order terms. So at the lowest orders, we recovered the Newtonian expressions for the energy, the total energy, uh, MV squared plus MC squared and m times velocity for the momentum. So we see that for non-relativistic motions, this notion really corresponds to the standard notion of energy and momentum with one additional correction, namely even for non-moving particles, we have to assign the energy of mc squared. And that's how we arrive at the probably most known equation in 20th century physics, E equals to mc squared. Uh, are there any questions? Okay, if not, we will go to the next topic. And this is the light rays. So the word lines of photons. Uh, I assume that the light rays travel, uh, travel always along uh, straight lines. So we don't consider any kind of refraction or refractive index. We are not in a medium, we are in vacuum where the light moves at the speed of light. Uh, in that case, we fix, uh, uh, we fix a point through which our uh, photon passes, let's say point A, we fix a vector L, which is null. By null, I mean that its product with itself is equal to zero, L times L equal to zero. This immediately translates to this condition over here. Uh, it's fairly easy to check that in that case, indeed the velocity, the standard velocity defined as the derivative of position with respect to the coordinate time is simply Li over LO, but we have checked that because of the null condition, LO has to be the square root of the uh, size of the spatial uh, part of the vector L. So this so the magnitude of this velocity is equal to one. So in any inertial frame, uh, a particle with tangent vector being a null vector will appear as a particle moving with the speed of light as it should happen. We have proved the uh, frame independence of the speed of light. If we simply repeated this calculation in a different inertial frame, it would look the same and would end up with the same result. The momentary velocity in this frame is again, has the magnitude of one, so the speed of light. Uh, just like in the case of massive particles, the parameterization lambda is not unique. There is a couple of things we can do with that. Uh, in fact, we can take any linear function, which uh, and applied to lambda, 
or in fact an affine function. So take a constant C and D and define new lambda C lambda plus D. We need to shift the initial point a little bit by minus DL. So we take a slightly different point along the curve as our reference point. And we have to also rescale the vector L, but it still remains now after the rescaling and everything works fine. Uh, unfortunately, we cannot play the game we played in, in the case of massive particles where there is a, a preferred parameterization, the, the proper time and a preferred tangent vector, which we call the four velocity. Uh, it's preferred in the sense that its product with itself is equal to minus one, so it's normalized. However, null vectors cannot be normalized. So no matter by what, what number you, you multiply L, its product with itself is just zero. And this also means that any L uh, of this kind is equally good and we, cannot, we have no preference of one over another. So there is no notion of four velocity or proper time for photons or for any particles moving uh, with the speed of light. This is a big difference between massive and massless particles. We cannot assign uh, a proper time to them and we cannot assign a preferred tangent vector. Uh, however, it is still possible to define the four momentum of a photon because photon as any other particle carries momentum and energy. Uh, and we simply define P mu to be the photon's energy. Yeah, Lecture. Sorry. Uh, excuse me. Is there a question? Oh, okay. Uh, so we define four momentum to be E over L zero L mu. Uh, and P just P the vector the four momentum is now the same way L is now. So P times P is equal to zero. And it's easy to check that if you, again, uh, break down the four momentum into energy and linear momentum, the null condition simply means that the energy is equal to the magnitude of momentum. And this is this is uh, uh, an old result um, dating back to Maxwell's equations and the electromagnetic waves. Indeed, they carry uh, energy with, uh, which is related to momentum by E equals to P times C. We have C equal to one, so we don't see it here. Any questions uh, regarding this? Uh, okay, I don't see any. Uh, so the last topic uh, I would like to talk with you regarding special relativity is the definition of, of light cones and causality. So uh, let's fix a point O. Uh, let's consider some kind of uh, inertial frame with, with uh, its center at this point O. Uh, now we can find the other point, we can check uh, the sign of the quantity delta x mu, delta x mu at E tower. Delta x is simply the uh, vector corresponding to the displacements between this point and O. So basically the coordinates of this point in this reference frame. And there is obviously three possibilities here. It is possible that this product is negative. Uh, this corresponds to points which lie inside a well-defined cone. Uh, here it looks more like a wedge, but this is because we are leaving, this picture over here is made in two-dimensional projection. In, in two or three D, it will look exactly like a cone um, with a vertex right here at O. Points inside this cone exactly correspond to points which are uh, uh, which are uh, whose product with itself is less than one. In this case, we call the interval between these points time-like if it's negative. Uh, the physical interpretation is that if this condition is true, uh, there, there exist word lines of massive particles which pass through O and through our new point over here. Uh, we can also consider the case when delta x times delta x is equal to zero. This will correspond simply to the surface of this cone. And this corresponds to points which can be connected by a light ray, a straight line, which is null. A very interesting and important point is that for these type of points, we can distinguish between the future and the past. In the sense that when you look at this light cone, it, it has the shape of two 
separate light cones touching at O uh, at the origin. We do not, uh, now the origin is exactly the presence of, of itself. However, one half of this light cone obviously uh, corresponds to the future of the point O. So uh, whatever word line we, we, we take passing through O and, and, and a given point, uh, O will always lie in the past of, 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 of this point. And the opposite is true for, for points lying in this past part. So the inside of the light cone is clearly separated into the future and to the past. And so is the surface of the light cone. However, uh, we can also consider space-time intervals, so things, events lying outside the light cone of, of a given point. And the point is that here we cannot make a clear-cut future and past distinction, or we can do it, but only in a frame-dependent way. So for a particular frame, we can consider the future uh, simply points for which CT is positive and as a past uh, points for which CT is negative. However, if we change the uh, reference frame, the initial reference frame, uh, this future and past distinction will change a little bit because of the simultaneity relativity. Uh, in fact, uh, it's easy to show that for any uh, point which is space-like space with respect to our O, we can find um, reference frames in which uh, CT is positive or negative. So in practice, we don't make any future and past distinctions uh, for points uh, separated in a space-like manner or by space-like interval from, from a given O. It's neither, they, they, they just like neither in the future nor in the past. They're just somewhere else. Now, a big part of special relativity is the assumption that there are no superluminal interactions. So all interactions, uh, all forces um, do not propagate faster than the speed of light. Uh, this also, of course, means that the word lines of particles which carry these interactions cannot light outside the light cone. So any word line of, of a massive particle will, will stay within every light cone of every point it passes through. Moreover, any events lying outside the light cone cannot influence what is happening in O, and O cannot influence them. So O can only influence whatever happens in O, it can influence only what happens in the inside or at the surface of the future light cone. On the other hand, the physics at O, the, the state of affairs at O, can only be influenced by what is happening in the past light cone. Yes. Uh, are there any questions to this? Uh, I have one. Can you hear yes. me? Hi. Go on. So the thing is that uh, in your plot, you have also made the line uh, not exactly straight. You have made it curve. Yes. So is there any reason for that? Because this is an accelerating particle, right? Yes, uh, there is no reason for that. Uh, we could consider a particle traveling over a straight line. It's just that even if the particle is interacting in a complicated way with, I don't know, electromagnetic field, it still has to stay with that inside the light cone. That's what I was yeah. trying to, to, this is mm -hmm. the point I tried to make. Mm -hmm. oh, okay, thank you. There is no deep reason behind that. Oh, okay, thank you. Okay, I have one question. Yes, please. Okay, if, if events uh, like outside of the future, they, they can't also influence like the O value or the... Uh, no, we... Okay, in most of physics, we assume that there is some kind of causality going on, uh, meaning that it is the future uh, state of affairs, which is determined by the past one, not the vice versa. Uh, how, how could I explain that? So imagine that, that the, 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 imagine that you've got an electromagnetic field uh, generated by sources, and you would like to know uh, what this, what what this electromagnetic field is at a given point uh, somewhere in the future light cone. And the question is, you need to somehow know the past and, and, and the sources uh, in the past in order to determine that. What would you need actually? In fact, in order to determine everything at the point O, you only have to know the state of the electromagnetic field and the sources inside the past light cone. That's, that's pretty okay. much the statement. Okay. Uh, okay. Thank you. Okay. Okay. I assume there are no more questions. 
yeah and i think we are done with the first lecture and that's very good uh now it's time for our first exercise class uh let me ask again the question does anybody have access to a graphics tablet uh so any device with which you can write on the screen of a computer uh if you don't then well i will do the exercise class myself but i will i would like to ask you to, to collaborate with that so i here's how it will be organized i will share my screen this time with a mm, uh, with a blackboard just a second please uh let's share screen again yeah that's it uh, uh can you see the screen yes yeah so this exercise class one uh, and there is a couple of problems i would like to discuss with you uh, problems in special relativity let me just open my notes Mm, sorry, I need to restart my device because there's something funny going on a bit. So I've got my notes for this class on my on another electronic device and I had to restart it unfortunately. So sorry for the delay. Uh, be somewhere here. Mm -hmm. uh, so we will begin by the, so we'll derive the formula for additional velocities. So relativistic addition of velocities. Uh, and it will be a rather simplified formula. We simply assume a two-dimensional case. So we assume that we have a frame. Let me draw it here. Uh, then inside this frame, we've got another moving with respect to that one. I assume it passes through exactly the same origin. So here we have X tilde CT tilde. Uh, and it's moving with velocity V as recorded by the frame, uh, by this orange frame without an tilde. And then we have yet another one. Let's say this one. CT double tilde and X double tilde. Um, and this one is moving with velocity V2. With respect to the blue one. So this is going to be V1. And now the question is, uh, what, 
is the velocity of double tilde with respect to ct x. We know the velocity of the tilde, uh, the standard free velocity of the tilde frame with respect to the orange one, and now we know the white one with respect to the blue one. But what is the velocity of the white one with respect to the orange one? Uh, any ideas how we might do it? First, we can write the transformations and then derivate it with respect to the time frame of respective, um, like yes. the respective velocities. And then... yes, I like I like this idea. I like this idea. Let's write the, the Lorentz transforms between these frames. So we've got the frame orange frame, how it is related to the uh, uh, okay, I will talk about the orange frame, the blue frame, and the white frame. So now we are we are uh, we will be expressing the orange the blue frame with with the or in terms of the orange frame. So that's the transformation. Uh, we can also write the same equation for the uh, white frame with respect to the blue frame. Gamma one is as usual the Lorentz factor, one minus V one squared. Gamma two minus gamma two V two minus gamma two V two gamma two. And we write CT tilde x tilde here. Uh, and now, uh, in principle, we could we could do what 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 you have suggested, namely simply consider a motion of a particle with respect to um, uh, which is at rest in the in the double tilde in the white frame, and then um, derive the the equation for this for its motion for its word line, and then consider the derivative with respect to the coordinate time in the orange frame and this way um, indeed we would get the right formula but there is a shorter way and the shorter way is simply to notice that v is already built in into the appropriate matrix of the uh, Lorentz transform namely if you take this term over here and divide it by this term you will simply get minus by, by v1. And the same goes for this transform. It's enough to divide two entries of this matrix to, uh, to obtain the velocity, the free velocity automatically, uh, the free velocity between these two frames. Now what we can do is simply to combine these two, two equations in order to, to get a relation between the orange frame CTX and the white frame. And this is simply done by multiplying these two matrices. So we've got a CT double tilde equal to gamma two minus gamma two V2 minus gamma two V2 gamma two. Uh, here we have gamma one minus gamma one V1 minus gamma one V1 gamma one times CT x is it clear what we are doing here it's simply substituting this equation over here into that one and this way we get we express the uh, components in the uh, double tilde frame directly with the non-tilde frame the rest is basically matrix multiplication so here we got gamma one gamma two uh plus gamma one gamma two v1 v2 that's multiplying this entry with this entry um here we will get this times that so it will be minus gamma one gamma two v1 uh right minus gamma one gamma two v2 and the same thing on the on this thing here. 
and here we got gamma one, gamma two, D one, D two, plus gamma one, gamma two, multiplying C T X. Okay, so this should give us the Lorentz transform between this frame and that frame. And in order to calculate the velocity itself, uh, let's call it let's call it maybe u. Uh, u the combined velocity. Well, this has to be the ratio of this guy over that guy. So with a minus. So here's what we get. Gamma one, gamma two, D one plus V two. That's just rewriting minus of this thing here. And here in the denominator, we can also uh, take gamma one and gamma two outside the parentheses. And it's possible to reduce this down to V1 plus V2 divided by one plus V1, V2. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. Are there any questions? So professor, just one thing, what is the formalism for U? Can you just remind me once? Uh, okay, U, uh, sorry, U is not the four velocity. U is the standard velocity. I just used the wrong mm -hmm. letter. Okay, so maybe I should use a wrong, a different letter. Uh, no, U, no, U, is no. U is simply the velocity. Okay, I should use a different letter. Let's, let me call it the capital V. No, mm -hmm. it should be easier. So the capital V, which is simply the velocity of, uh, of the double tilde frame with respect to the uh, frame without a tilde. The standard velocity defined as the uh, ratio of uh, of the distance you pass over the over the time, the coordinate time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, the nice thing the nice thing about this formula is that um, when you consider uh, uh, if you if you consider one of these particles to be traveling with, with the velocity of light, mm -hmm. uh, what you get is V1 plus C over one. C is basically one in our case, one plus V1 times one, which is one plus V1 over one plus V1, which is one. So yeah. whenever one of these velocities is C, the result is C. So uh, no matter what happens, a particle which travels with the velocity of light with respect to one frame will also travel with would also appear traveling with the velocity of light in any yeah, other yeah. frame. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's the standard formula for addition of velocities. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm, okay. I write number here. Let's go to the next problem I wanted to talk about. This is the Lorentz contraction. It's also a, a, a classical problem. Uh, I need a new blood. I need a new whiteboard. Mm -hmm. So this is number two. Uh, and here is the setup. So again, we consider a simplified two-dimensional situation with a given frame, x0 and x1 will be the time and the spatial axis. And now I assume that there is a, that there is a bar which is at rest with respect to uh, x0. A bar is represented not by a word line, but more of a world ribbon, so to say. Uh, the bar extends from the point zero to L and it's given, its world ribbon is given by this, a world stripe is given by this type of formula. So you see one of the end corresponds to X one equal to zero, the other end corresponds to X one equal to one. 
and the obviously the size the, the length of this bar um, in the frame uh, without the tilde is equal to l but we also introduce another frame we're just moving with a relativistic speed with respect to the previous one x1 tilde, x0 tilde. Mm. And the question is, what is the length of, of the same bar as measured in this uh, moving frame, the blue frame or the frame with tilde? And here's how I would like to approach this problem. Uh, so we will simply parameterize this ribbon over here. Uh, the ribbon will be parameterized by t, uh, the proper time of each, let's say, element of this of this uh, bar, and lambda, which parameterizes the bar itself. Uh, lambda extends from zero to l, um, and in the standard frame we simply have x not equal to t, x one equal to lambda. Now, how would you approach this problem? How would you measure the uh, length of this bar in the moving frame? Any ideas? Okay, I would simply begin with the Lorentz transform. So let's express the uh, tilde coordinates with respect to x0. So we have X zero. Uh, do you understand this? What I have done here, by the way. So, I would like to obtain a formula for every point uh, inside the stripe. Lambda measures simply the point of the bar along 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 the bar from zero to l, and t measures the coordinate time in which I I, I take this point. And this way, by taking each possible every possible lambda and every t, I can get every point on this stripe. Now I describe this situation in the uh, tilde frame, the moving frame. Uh, I'm sorry, this is x naught mm, minus gamma v x one and x tilde one is equal to minus gamma v x naught plus gamma x one. That's just the Lorentz transform. Yes, I had a question. Yes. Uh, so the thing is that the measurement of the length, even mm -hmm. in uh, X frame, not the prime frame, even in yes. X frame, uh, that is also constrained by the speed of light, right? In a sense, in practical sense, yes. But the measurement is, we'll get to that, what we actually mean by the measurement. But let me put, frame it this way. By measurement, we mean basically taking the difference between the position of one end of the of, of the bar and the other end of the bar at a given moment. And a given moment means a moment in terms of a particular frame. Okay. Uh, yeah, because I think so that when we are trying to measure the length as well, and mm -hmm. if we don't consider this constraint with respect to time, mm -hmm. then uh, the measurement can also change, right? Uh, so yeah in practical sense so the, the finite speed of light uh, indeed limits what we can do in, in some sense mm -hmm. however it's not a still it's not so much of a problem uh, to measure the length of of of, of a bar uh, if you have just uh, if you're using just light uh, let me put it this way. No matter how we do it, the definition of length is that we take the situation at a given moment, meaning mm -hmm. a, a slice of constant x0, a given uh, moment in, in this frame. We look at the positions of the two ends of the bar and we simply uh, subtract them. And that's the length. Okay. Okay. 
Okay. Thank you. Okay. Now we go to the mathematics. Uh, we would not, we would like to see what this thing looks like in uh, uh, in the tilted frame. Uh, I will. So we substitute T and lambda here. By T and lambda, now we mean uh, the parameters describing the, the this stripe over here. Uh, Uh, and what we will do is simply, so now we do the following problem. Uh, we do the following thing. Uh, measuring in the moving frame amounts to taking the state of the bar for some constant x tilde naught. So let's fix x tilde naught and see what corresponds to uh, in the uh, to what points on the on this ribbon it corresponds to. So if we fix x to the not, uh, from that we can express t as being one over gamma x to the not uh, plus v lambda. I just express t in terms of lambda and x to the not, which I consider a fixed parameter. Now, uh, I go back to x tilde one. I would like to see the positions. So x tilde one is simply equal to minus gamma v one over gamma x tilde naught plus v lambda plus gamma lambda. And here we can simplify the terms. And if we do it, what we get is minus the x tilde naught that comes from the first quantity. And then we get plus gamma one minus v squared lambda. Okay, so now we know that at a given time in the, in the moving frame, uh, the position of uh, of the part of the uh, of an element of the of the bar parameterized by lambda is given by this formula over here. This is x lambda naught. Now, in order to calculate the length in the new frame, so let's call it L tilde. What we simply need to do is to subtract the position of the uh, of one endpoint. Uh, from the other endpoint. So let's try to do it. So we take x1 for uh, lambda equal to L minus x bar one for lambda equal to zero. This term over here will simply subtract. It will not matter. And here from these two terms, we get gamma one minus V squared L. Because for L, this is, this term times L for lambda equals zero, this also vanishes, so we're left with that. And now in the last point, we realize, we remind ourselves what gamma really was. It was one over the square root of one minus V squared. So we are left with one over one minus V squared L or one over gamma L. Obviously we have that L tilde is smaller than L, exactly by this Lorentz factor, and this is known as the Lorentz contraction. Uh, what is the physical understanding of what is going on here? Well, we simply look at the at this type of stationary bar, which is stationary at uh, at frame x. Uh, we looked at the x bar. We look at the situation in the x bar frame, uh, and at the given moment, given by the 
time flow of the of the tilted frame uh, of the tilde frame we simply uh, calculate the difference of the positions of the two points of this of this bar and it turns out that this position is smaller than the one uh, you get in this uh, in the common v frame any questions was the derivation clear uh, so i also had one more question where yes uh, when we are having x1 prime uh, or x1 tilde so yes. in that transformation itself we can consider that um, the time can be constant because at certain constant time we are measuring this uh, velocity mm -hmm. and then when we just find the derivative uh, not with respect to anything so just dx1 lambda we directly get uh, gamma uh, gamma la uh, d lambda so the yeah. point is that dx1 uh, tilde is measuring the length of uh, the like mm -hmm whatever element that is so the length mm -hmm. of that thing has uh, to be smaller in the frame of reference of x naught mm -hmm. so this also shows length contraction but i think so that the gamma factor over here is one upon gamma times l so mm -hmm. this is uh, with respect to the frame of reference of x naught so so uh, if i understand correctly what worries you is that here in this formula mm -hmm. Uh, let me use a different color, let's say green. In this formula, the relation between x1 uh, tilde and x1 is given by multiplication by gamma. Yeah. So it seems that you have x1 equal to gamma x1. And on yes. a very naive level, you might think that uh, the length of L will therefore correspond to gamma times L. And here we have obviously one over gamma times yeah, L. Yeah, yeah. But this is this is yeah I know that this is not the right one but this is actually imagining it from one frame of reference to the other right uh, yes but you're not taking but we'll talk it in in, in a second what is uh -huh. crucial here is how this measurement is made you have uh -huh. to make sure that you're comparing apples with apples and oranges with oranges uh -huh. you have to make sure that you are comparing the positions of uh, the two endpoints of your bar. Uh -huh. uh, at the same moment in the frame of reference in which you are making the measurement. Now, uh, what you are do, you obtain this result if you insisted on comparing this point with this point, the position of this point with this point uh, in the tilted frame. But for somebody in the tilted frame, this would not be a proper measurement. You see, you're not looking at this, you're not measuring their positions at the same moment. Quite the contrary, you're measuring measuring the, the position of one endpoint a bit earlier and this one a bit later. So this is not a proper measurement. Yeah, because when we uh, put the speed of light uh, over there as, so from uh, the point um, zero comma L, if we draw a, a line which goes with respect to the speed of light, automatically we see, uh, uh, not from there, from the other point. Here? Yes. So okay, if there is a, a line which goes with respect to the speed of light, then mm -hmm. we can see over there that whatever length is measured in that frame of reference, which is cutting that line x naught tilde, is larger than the length which is measured by uh, the, uh, is larger than this x naught. So that is how the perception is that uh, in prime frame, the length, whatever length is there, will be like will be contracted in x not frame, right? It's in it's, more, it's more complicated than that. You see, uh -huh. if you consider if you consider it a, a bar which is at rest with respect to the, to the tilde frame, mm -hmm. it would appear contracted for the uh, for an observer in the non tilde frame actually. So okay. you you'll see it in a second. It looks paradoxical. It seems that by uh, boosting our our frame uh, adding velocity you're you're just making things smaller but that's a bit of an illusion for yeah. somebody in the uh, for if you have a if you have a body a, a bar which is at rest with the x frame and you measure its length in the in the tilde frame it mm -hmm. will appear shorter however if you have a bar in the tilde which is at rest in the tilde frame it will appear shorter for somebody in the non tilde frame you will see yes. it in a second uh, okay Okay, so let's go to the second part of this problem. Uh,
Okay, so I started discussing a paradox which might arise here. So imagine that we have two bars, not, not just one. So we, we've got our reference frame x not x1. We have our bar. And it's corresponding world stripe, so to say. Extending as before to L. We take the other reference frame. X1 tilde. Uh, the constant uh, L. So the point corresponding to L on this frame appears somewhere here. So the, the, I, now, I now position a point. I, I have this is a point along the axis X tilde one, which corresponds to the same length L. It's very obvious that in this case, uh, this bar appears to have a much shorter length, but assume that we also have, might be this one. We also have a bar of length L in the moving frame over here. And now see what stra how strange thing happens. I'm not very good at drawing. I'm very sorry for that. Uh, uh, you have to stretch your imagination and imagine that this is a straight line. Um, okay. Now what happens is that uh, for somebody in the, in the non-tilted frame, uh, this bar, which appears to have the length of L in the tilted frame will appear shorter. Uh, how is this possible at the same time? That uh, well, the reason is basically that the the measurement has to be done appropriately. Uh, for somebody in the uh, non tilde frame, uh, the measurement of the blue of the blue bar as done by its commoving frame. So comparing the difference of the positions of this point with this point or this event with this event, this is not a proper length measurement because instead of measuring uh, the, 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 the size of the length of this bar at a given moment, so we make a picture, we fix the, the moment of time, and then we uh, subtract the position of one endpoint from the other endpoint, uh, we measure the position of one endpoint at, at, at points at, at x0 equal to zero, but the other at point at, at some later point. And since the bar is moving, this looks like a corrupted measurement for somebody uh, in the orange frame. Mm. The proper measurement would gives this gives simply one over gamma L. But the situation is perfectly reversed if we consider the bar which is co-moving with the uh, with the X frame, the frame without the tilde. The measurement by an observer associated with this with this frame uh, simply does not appear like a proper measurement uh, for an observer in the tilde frame. Again, the measurement of the of of one of the endpoints seems to be too early with respect to the measurement of, of the other endpoint. So there is no contradiction here. Uh, the bar, the frame with a tilde, for somebody uh, in the frame of a tilde, uh, the lengths of, of, of objects, of bars, come moving with, with, the un, with the no tilde frame appear shorter and vice versa. Uh, bars which are come moving with the tilde frame appear shorter to an observer at the uh, in the other frame. Uh, is it more or less clear or do you need more explanation? Uh, it's clear. Okay. 
So uh, we will not cover time dilation, the other important effect here, you'll have it as a homework. Uh, and now I think it's a good time for a 15 minute break. So let's meet uh, 15 past 10. Very well, uh, we can begin the second part of our lecture. So let's go back to the uh, to my notes and to share my screen. Can you see the blackboard? Uh, yes. Thank you very much. Okay, so during the last uh, exercise class, we uh, we derived the equation for the relativistic velocity addition in one dimension and for the uh, for the Lorentz contraction. I leave the time dilation as a homework. So today I will the, the first problem sheet will, sheet will be out. Uh, it will be two or at most three uh, problems, not difficult ones, uh, all basically uh, all basically connected with special relativity. And my idea was to give you three weeks for that. Are you okay with three weeks? Uh, yes. Yes, sir. I think three weeks should be absolutely enough. Okay, so let's go to the next problem. So, uh, Relativistic velocity addition and Lorentz contraction are always discussed when you uh, look at a special relativity textbook because they're important from conceptual perspective. But I would argue they're not that important from practical perspective. You rarely measure them. What is really important, uh, especially for astrophysicists, I think, is a different effect, namely the Doppler, the Doppler effect. Uh, just to remind you, the Doppler effect is simply uh, the change of, a of the frequency uh, of light ray between the observer and the source uh, due to their relative motion. So the, the source emits light with a given frequency because of a very fine, a very narrow spectral line. This is then received by an observer who measures the frequency and notices a shift uh, due to the relative motion of both of them. Uh, it was already known in uh, 1800s, uh, in fact, first I think observed for sound waves, but it also exists for electromagnetic and gravitational waves, and it's actually of big importance in astrophysics. So we will now derive the full relativistic formula for waves uh, propagating with the speed of light which simply means gravitational and electromagnetic waves in our case. Uh, so I will first draw a picture uh, and show you how exactly we'll do it. So we assume that we have a source which is moving some of, somehow through the space time, not necessarily over a straight line. Uh, that's the source. And we have an observer also moving through the space time. The observer doesn't have to be inertial, really. Uh, we pick up one point, which we call the emission point. So the source is sending electromagnetic or other types of signals in all possible directions, but there is obviously one light ray, which reaches the observer at the observation point. Uh, at the moment of let me use a different color. At the moment of emission, the source has the four velocity of us. And the observer has the four velocity of uo. Mm. Is there anything else? So these are four velocities, they are properly normalized. Okay, now the source has his or her proper time, let me use for example this color, which we'll call sigma. Uh, the observer has his or her proper time, which we call tau. This means that dx observer over d tau is equal to u o mu and dx 
source mu over d sigma is equal to u e mu at every moment. Now, there is a connecting null uh, line between these two points. So let's call delta x uh, of tau and sigma the difference between the positions at the point tau and at the corresponding point sigma. Uh, now, if they're supposed to correspond to uh, emission and observation of a light ray, obviously this delta x has to be null. So we must have delta x times delta x equal to zero uh, at, let's say, sigma corresponding to sigma zero, tau corresponding to tau zero. That's sigma zero, that's tau zero. Okay, this connecting null line over here, I will also write an equation for that. Uh, it has the form of x e of sigma, that's the point e here, plus lambda k mu, where k mu is a kind of tangent vector here. Let's use this color here. Uh, yes. Are there any questions to this setup? Okay. I don't see any relativistic formula. Now the Doppler effect is basically about the uh, the rate of flow of time at the sources side, side and the rate of flow of time at the observer side as measured by the connecting null geodesics. So let's now think about the uh, flow of time here. So we've got our fiducial, the initial connecting geodesics between E and O, but now we allow the, a little bit of time to evolve, uh, a little bit more time to evolve. We consider a geodesic slightly later, a, a null line connecting these po two points at a slightly later moment. I write it as a dotted line here. At a slightly later moment, x mu of tau zero plus delta tau, the position of the observer is basically the initial position plus, I'm using the Taylor expansion. In the Taylor expansion would have the observers for velocity times delta tau plus higher order terms, which we will neglect. Uh, the source also moves a little bit by some kind of delta sigma. So we've got the initial pos the position at the moment, sigma zero first, and then we add the first order correction. So this is supposed to be S. U S mu times delta sigma plus all of delta squared. Okay, we assume that uh, after after a short while, uh, the there's another now now uh, straight line connecting these two uh, word lines. So we assume that x naught mu of tau naught plus delta tau minus x source mu. Delta sigma, I will call it delta x prime mu. This is still null. Uh, so what I would like to do right now is to write the condition for this thing to, to remain null. And I'm only interested in the linear terms in, in the time flow because I just want to see how the time uh, how the proper time will change along the 
how geodesics and uh, unlock the all the word line of the observer and how it will change along the line of the source. And sir, I have a doubt. Yes. Uh, I have a doubt regarding this delta x. Uh, so this x not mu tau and this x e mu sigma. So these yes. are the moment into different frame, right? Uh, I'm describing everything in a completely external frame, which knows not. Okay, so there is a frame here, which knows nothing about the four velocities of the source and of the observer. So there is a frame here, and here you have x i, and it's not related to, the, to to any of them. It's just a convenience tools for me to write these equations. Okay. So there is an external frame in which I describe everything. I should have stated this on the very beginning. This is written in some kind of external frame. I'm not connecting it in any way with any of those. In fact, I wanted to keep this derivation sort of frame independent, just to show you that it's very often convenient to use a frame which is related to neither of these things. Yeah. Okay. And I also had one more question. Can yes. I... Sure. So yes. when we are writing delta x dot delta x equals to zero, yes. over there, how are we defining delta x? Because over here, these are like uh, mu raised up. And we are, so these will be mu raised down, right? When we are doing uh, this. At, at the moment, I'm not raising or lowering indices. This is, right. at the moment, I, I did not introduce this operation. All indices are up indices. Yeah, so we just do a normal multiplication with respect to these, uh, and that should be equal to zero. This is basically delta x mu, delta x mu, delta mu. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, okay, thank you. That's it. So uh, I have a doubt. Uh, so uh, when you uh, when we consider the interval, we have to uh, because uh, if uh, if we uh, if we measure the length of a road, so we have to uh, find the endpoints at the same time. Uh, so here uh, in in the formula delta x, uh, the x naught to mu is a, uh, is a the proper time of uh, in, uh, in the proper time of a source and then um, sigma uh, the proper time of emission. These tau and the sigma are the proper times of a source and a observer. So yes. uh, the clocks are, if the clocks are not synchronized, how can we write this? Uh, because uh, when we consider an interval, uh, so we have to be very careful. The interval, the, we have to consider the uh, measure the endpoints at the same mm -hmm. time. So here, so, yeah. Yes. Okay, so so this is quite different from the from the previous problem. Now we are not attempting to measure anything in, in, in simultaneously. Quite the contrary, we assume that we've got the source. The source is emitting continuously um, some kind of radiation. However, it does not have to be identical at every moment. The, the, this radiation history depends on the source's proper time, sigma. Okay, And this radiation is emitted into the whole space-time. Then somewhere else, we've got the observer who is traveling through the space-time along a different world line. The observer has his or her proper time tau, which is independent of sigma. And at a particular moment, tau, he or she is receiving radiation emitted at a particular moment uh, of the source's history. So this equation over here, in fact, gives um, it's an implicit equation for the relation between tau and sigma. At a given moment of, of observer's proper time, he or she uh, 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 is, is uh, receiving radiation, which was emitted at an earlier moment, sigma, as defined by the source's proper time. So there's a one, there's an implicitly defined function tau of sigma given by the way uh, light travels through the space time. Uh, so uh, the defined delta sigma has uh, no that much physical uh, meaning. It's just a definition, uh, just defined uh, for our purpose. So, uh, which one could you repeat? So uh, this delta x will be defined for our purpose. It has no physical. Delta x? Yeah, yeah, this yeah, delta x has... mu. Two it has, sigma. It has yeah. been, it's, the, it's the difference of pos positions uh, between the uh, points of uh, observation and of emission. Uh, yeah, th yeah, that was my question. Uh, if we uh, if we consider the difference between two points, we have to be uh, we have to measure the uh, these points at the same time. Yes, so, so there is an external frame in which I do all the calculation. It has nothing to do with the source or the observer. It's just an external inertial frame in which I do calculations. And in these frames, x mu has the value of x zero mu. 
uh, diameters positions x. Uh, it should be x source mu, right? So, so, uh, so we have to uh, we have to express the tau and the sigma in a um, in an another frame. Uh, so that uh, x not x one to measure. Uh, every, everything is measured in one frame. So there's an external frame. I would call it, let's say, P. And everything is written in this external frame. In this frame, external frame, uh -huh. I've got the, the equation for the word line of the source. I've got the equation of the word line for the observer. The equation is simply X O mu of tau. That's the word line of the observer in this frame P. And X S mu of sigma. Uh, again, expressed in this external uh, frame P. Oh, now, okay, thanks. Uh, it's now it's clear. Yes, yes, thanks. Yes. And now P. Now the source is sending signals, and I would like to connect points on the observer's word line with the points in the on the source's word line, such that the light or or other type of signal emitted at at, at a moment sigma zero is received at tau zero. And what I'm really interested in is exactly the relation between sigma and tau. This equation here implicitly gives me this relation. I don't want to solve it. We could do it, but it's quite a complicated calculation. I would prefer to avoid that. And there is, I'm not interested in this formula by itself. It's more the derivative of this formula, which is interesting. We'll see in a second. Okay, thanks. Uh, thank you so much. Okay, so we have picked a particular moment in which the source has sent a, a, a particular signal, a particular type of radiation, and it was emitted at a particular moment tau o. We assume we know that. And then we, and then we would like to move a bit into the future, but only very little, uh, so that we could use the linear approximation. So we assume that the uh, proper time has increased by delta tau on the observer side. This means that on the sources side, it has to it has to increase by some corresponding delta sigma, not necessarily equal to delta tau. The positions then change according to the Taylor series, where we neglect the second order effects, we get, if this was delta x, then this will be delta x prime. Oh, it's written this way. And the assumption is that it, it's still now. So delta x prime dot delta x prime is zero. Uh, uh, delta x prime, if we calculate it properly, that will be mu, that will be x uh, o mu of tau zero. So the observation point, the original observation point minus the original emission point, plus the linear corrections, u o mu delta tau minus u e u s mu delta sigma plus O of delta squared. Okay. Uh, let's try to write this equation over here, but I need to go to the next blackboard. Well, that's going to be x mu observer of tau naught minus x mu source of sigma naught. And this is just our original delta x plus the corrections. plus what we neglect, and this is multiplied by itself. Okay, I did not want to write the same thing again. Uh, we're calculating basically the square of that with this scalar product. Uh, so what we will have is basically delta x times delta x. Delta x will also appear here, uh, plus these u o minus u s. On top of that, we will have two times delta x scalar product with u o delta sigma 
uh, minus u s delta tau. I'm not using indices here. And then we'll have the square of that, but this is obviously quadratic in linear perturbations. So that's something we neglect, okay? By assumptions, that was supposed to be zero. And also delta x prime times delta x prime was supposed to be zero. So we end up with a simple statement that delta x times u o delta sigma minus delta x times u s delta tau is equal to zero. And that's a very nice equation. It gives us the relation between delta sigma and delta tau at the leading order, namely uh, delta sigma over delta tau. That has to be delta x times uh, uo over delta x times us. Is it correct? Uh, yes, sorry, I've, I've made a mistake above here. Mm. Here it is. It's supposed to be tau here and sigma here. Sorry for that. So the proper time of observers tau and the proper time of sources sigma. So you've got delta sigma times that. Yes, now it's correct. Uh, one more thing we can we can notice is that uh, delta x. If we go back to the previous slide, there's one more thing we can do with this formula because we are almost there. Uh, so if we go back to the formula for the null vector, for, for, for this null straight line connecting E and O, uh, we see that delta x is simply equal to, let's say, some kind of lambda observations times k, where k was this null vector which gives the direction of the photon propagation. So delta x is proportional to k. Now, if we go back to our previous formula, what we discover is that this means that we can simply write, write as k times u naught over k times us, where k is just any kind of vector proportional to delta x or any kind of vector defining the direction of light propagation. So this is the null vector, null vector defining the right propagation. Okay, uh, what does this equation mean? Well, it means that uh, if we consider a short period of time in the observer's frame, delta tau, and we compare the observation of light made at tau zero at tau zero plus delta tau, uh, we will see the radiation emitted at sigma zero and sigma zero plus delta sigma. So uh, this formula gives us how much faster and how much shorter we, the, the observer sees the, uh, sees the things happening uh, in the sources uh, around the source. Now, in order to pass to the proper Doppler formula, we have to consider periodic signals. So we assume that, assume that uh, the source is sending periodic signals. For example, an electromagnetic wave with frequency omega with circular frequency omega. Uh, omega s as measured in the source's proper time. So the, uh, yeah. So the period mm, between let's say two crests of, of this electromagnetic wave uh, is simply two pi over omega s. 
this period obviously corresponds to delta tau equal to k times u o over k times u s delta sigma simply from sorry mm -hmm. yes simply from uh, by transforming this formula over here uh, this is k times us 2 pi over omega s over k times u o and now we can derive the final formula for the circular frequency omega s equals to 2 pi over sorry omega o equals to 2 pi over delta tau this is the circular frequency of the same wave but as measured by the observer and this is quite easy to see k times Let's have a look at that. K times U. O over K times us omega s yes i think so so that's the doppler shift formula you can see that these frequencies are proportional with the proportionality given by the products of the four velocities with the null vector k, whichever null vector you use to represent the particular motion. Any questions to this derivation? I don't see any. So let's move forward. Uh, so for electromagnetic waves, we define uh, the redshift. Z as the omega source divided by omega O minus one. Uh, this quantity is larger than one when the energy in the source's frame is larger than in the observer's frame. Or in other words, uh, when the uh, when the when a given spectral line is shifted towards the red part of the spectrum, lower frequencies, so we observe the omega to be lower than the omega sigma, then the redshift is positive. So from that we see that z is equal. Uh, again, I want to have a look at the previous equation just to be sure. Uh, mm -hmm. This will be K times U S divided by K times U O minus one. Okay, this is not a very common used formula uh outside the relativistic circles people very often use this formula in a slightly different form uh and in this form we will simply pass uh, we will now derive this formula in standard notation so uh, we pass to the observer's frame So, so far this formula was derived in any frame unrelated to observer or the source. It's independent of, of, of uh, any kind of uh, 
structures like frames we, we, we might be using. Now we are moving to a particular frame, the observer's co-moving frame. In this frame, the observer's for velocity has a very nice form. It's just one, zero, zero, zero. And the sources for velocity, well, we will write it as gamma, gamma times the standard three velocity, with gamma being the Lorentz factor. Mm. As for k mu, we will take to be uh, a number we don't really care very much about, one and minus vector r, where r is a unit vector, unit vector defining the direction of light propagation. This is a free vector. And in the observer's frame, it defines the direction from which the observer sees the light coming. This is a free vector. Mm. K mu is obviously null in this case. So K times K is equal to zero. You can check that yourselves. Uh, and in this setup, we can calculate again, Z. So let's write it this one, one plus Z uh, equals to omega S over omega O is equal to K times omega S. So let's calculate K times omega S. This is K zero from this, then we have one times gamma, but with a minus, and then we multiply this with that. So that's minus gamma V times R. And in the denominator, we've got this times this. So that's again, K zero, and we only have minus one. So the result is in the end very nice. It's gamma one plus V times R. This thing here is simply the radial velocity. Okay, this is a much more common formula for, for the relativistic redshift. Uh, we can write it even nice in an even nicer way. This is one plus the radial velocity divided by one over square root minus the full velocity squared. Uh, okay. Uh, it looks a bit complicated, but we will do a few more magic tricks in order to see uh, what it looks like in, in simplified situations. Uh, do you have any questions to this derivation? Possibly none. So let's go here. Mm. So there's a couple of interesting uh, situations. So first we look at radial velocity only. So V is equal to the radial velocity times the radial vector, unit vector, and there is no transverse velocity. In that case, one plus Z is equal to one plus the radial velocity divided by the square root of one minus, again, radial velocity squared. But it's easy to see that this is the square root of one minus plus, uh, one minus velocity R, the radial velocity times square root of one, one plus this velocity. So we get in the end, the square root of one plus VR over one minus VR. Uh, for small four velocities, when VR is much smaller than one, it's easy to see that this is simply the VR 
plus O of VR squared. And this is in, in the standard terminology VR over C. So the radial velocity uh, at the lowest order uh, gives us the direction of VR over C. Another interesting case is the transverse velocity only. In that case, we assume that V is equal to V transverse with V transverse times the radial vector being zero. And now one plus Z is equal to one plus zero. There is no radial component. One minus V transverse squared. Yeah, and then the interesting thing is that now the leading order is just one plus one half of velocity of transfer velocity squared plus a third order term. Uh, sorry, there's no one here. And this is of the order of V transverse squared over C squared. Uh, since the velocities in real life are usually very small with respect to the speed of light, it's obvious to see that the radial component of velocity produces a much more much stronger Doppler effect than the transverse one. However, there is still a transverse velocity, transverse Doppler shift as well, even in the absence of any uh, uh, velocity in the direction of line of sight, there will be a redshift effect anyway. Oh, I have a question here. Actually, sorry, it's one plus here. Uh, yes, uh, go on. Yeah. yeah, so this is one plus, right? So that is the question that I had. Yeah, but shouldn't there... it be one, one plus half VR? Where? Uh, so in the first term, so one plus Z equals to one plus half VR because we are also taking the approximation of the square root, right? Uh, here, uh, yeah. okay, no, not really, because apart from square root, you've got this thing here. So let's do it in slow motion. Uh, we can take this one. So this is the square root of one plus VR. This is a small thing, but uh, it's important for theoretical physicists to be able to do calculations like that in an efficient way. So you're right that we will have to approximate the square root, but what we have under the square root is two things. Uh, mm -hmm. We've got one. So in the in the numerator, we've got one over one minus VR plus VR over one minus VR. And now look, this thing here is basically VR plus higher order terms. Yes. This thing here uh, is one, one plus VR. Mm -hmm. No, it's not just one, it's one plus VR ah, okay. plus higher order terms. Mm -hmm. So what we have is the square root of one plus two VR. Oh, okay. And then we can approximate that by, by one plus half of what is here, which is one plus VR plus higher order terms. So everything works fine. Okay. 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 And one more thing. Uh, there is yet more different form in which this formula sometimes appears. Uh, so we assume that we've got our observer here. Uh, we've got our connecting line over here. We've got our source here and the velocity is, let's say, in this direction. Uh, R, the vector R is over here. It's the unit vector which gives us the direction from which the light is coming. And we define theta to be the angle between V and the radial vector, which is minus R. So theta is arc cosine. Uh, D times R with a minus divided by the length of D. 
okay I need to move to another layer so in that case we need the radial component so r times v that is minus the magnitude of v cosine theta the square of the transverse vector that's no we don't need that actually and then we can use the formula that one plus z is one plus r times v divided by one minus v squared so this is one minus let's call it simply v v cosine theta divided by the square root of one minus v squared and in the final step we will go back to the standard system of units this is one minus the standard velocity let's say v old over c cosine theta over square root of one minus v old squared divided by c squared i think this is the most common form of this formula in this parametrization okay are there any questions to this formula okay i can't hear any questions uh i had one more topic to do the, the, the stellar aberration effect or the light aberration effect but i didn't manage to do it but that's okay we can do it next week next week uh and as for today i think this would be all uh so i will prepare a problem sheet it should appear within one two days uh i will let you know by email it will be on the website of the of the course the the deadline would be around three weeks 